everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Starting Actor. I am Vinnie Horst, and on this channel, I talk about the real world of acting by a guy who is starting out in the industry and kind of figuring, thing, uh, figuring things out as I go. So if that sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing. Today, I am overjoyed and very happy to have a friend of mine join me today, Rochelle Racine. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you very much for, for joining me. So. Rochelle and I know each other from, uh, from various things, but mostly having trained together at the Active Studio of Orange County, taking some classes uh, together. And I wanted to invite uh, Rochelle today to, to talk about her experience as uh, an actor uh, in the industry and, and going through these, this, this time that is COVID, number one, and number two, just learning how she's going about learning and her learning experience as an actor. So thanks again, Michelle, for coming by. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So first thing is first, Rochelle, tell me about us. Tell us about who you are, where you come from, and yeah, just a little bit about you. Okay, well, I'm Rochelle, hi guys, and I am from San Diego. I literally grew up like on the Mexico-US border. You can see Mexico from my house. Um, I. My mother is Iranian, my father's side is French, and I i guess here's where I kind of start talking about acting. I've only been in acting, training for acting for a year, but it's something I've wanted to do my whole life. And um, I did the whole college, get your corporate job yeah. life. I know and that. although I do like my job, I don't want to do it forever. And, um, I'm going to get kind of deep right off the bat. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> my, my dad passed away two years ago. Sure. And um, in that process, I learned, realized, I should say, that he lived his entire life for everybody else in the family and never for him. And he would always talk about, oh, when I retire, I'm going to be a voiceover actor. Uh, I come from a family of entertainers, actors and filmmakers. Um, and so when he didn't get to do that, I decided... I'm gonna go do what I've always wanted to do. Now, of course, this was after he passed away and over a year afterwards of going through like much depression and like an identity crisis and you know, all that. But, um, you know, it led to good things. So I kind of had a aha moment, signed up and two weeks later, I started at the actor Studio. Yeah. yeah. So ugh, lots to unpack. Yeah, lots to unpack. <laughs> but, uh, I on, on the on the lighter of the notes, it, you came from a background such as mine, uh, from corporate America, where you have gone through, and you, you weren't like, because there's some people that just, they start acting right from day one, I know I want to be an actor. Well, you said you did, but yeah. you didn't start that way. You started doing, you know, a day job, as it were, and, and so on, and, and you've arrived at a moment now in your life where you're, you're focusing on acting. I, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an important, um, context i suppose that, that that people should be aware of that it's not it's not you don't have to start when you're when you're no. uh, a young person you can you can start whenever you want so completely it's a learned skill. actually when i first started um doing this process people that i don't consider friends they're like on the outer circle more like acquaintances everybody everybody would say oh aren't you too old no really? and if anybody ever tells you that like move on just turn around and leave because that age as crazy and as uh, against what most people think, it doesn't matter in this business. It yeah. does not matter. There's characters of every age. And as a matter of fact, commercials are booking more and more people in like their 50s than up because there's such a huge market, right. <laughs> you know? So like age has nothing to do with anything in this business. So absolutely, I'll, I'll two, yeah. two points to that. One, one of the most recent things that I did it wasn't uh, theatrical, but it was it was uh, an industrial, uh, which is to say, uh, like a like a training video, I suppose, for for hospitals. And you can imagine that video had to do with older people. I'm I'm not necessarily old, but I was playing the son of a of a of an elderly patient, and we we had a whole. But there's lots of that type of work. That's my point. That's number one. And number two, I think you know when when your friends were acquaintances. We're saying that you're too old. I think I think we, we tend to lose track 
or when we think about Hollywood, we think about the young superstars, the people who are making those millions of dollars, who are beautiful and fit and this and that and all the things that I'm not, right? But it doesn't matter because, yeah, they might make the millions, but I can make, I can make the thousands uh, of dollars by having regular work as a regular actor, a character actor, somebody who's just playing a role and filling the voids and working next to those superstars. Right. I think that's something that a lot of people who are not in the industry overlook and they don't even realize if anything is that you don't have to be famous to be a working actor. Yeah. That is such a small percentage of actors that make a decent living, you know? And even if you are an actor now and you that is your goal, great, that's a wonderful goal, but like realize that your goal, in my opinion, at the end of the end of the day, should just be you need you want a book and you want to be a working actor. Being famous is the reward for knowing your brand, working your ass off, and knowing how to get proper representation to get you there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things you said right there is 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 working your working your ass off, and I think part of that is definitely I'm finding is is the training aspect. So I wanted to touch on that with you because in my little circle. Uh, of, of people that I know, you're kind of legendary for going out and, and seeking training and seeking opportunity to learn. So tell me, I mean, tell me about your schedule in the last year and how you've been doing your training. <laughs> First of all, I need to say that I have an addiction. So like, don't try to do what I do because it's, it's insanity and I realized that. <laughs> um, but okay, so for, I've been doing this for a year. I started small with one of the beginning courses that one of the beginning pillars at Actor Studio, just to see if I'd like it. Fell in love pretty much immediately. Um, started at Delmar Media Arts. I know you were a student of them too, yeah. about a month later. And I was doing two classes at the time, one there, one at Actor Studio. Um, once I developed the discipline to be able to start adding more classes, I began to do so. Um, for the most part, prior to COVID, I was taking about three, maybe four, depending on the type of class um, at a time per mm -hmm. term. Um, I would do four if I didn't have homework in every single one of the classes. When you have homework, that really changes things. So, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> not only do you have the homework where you're uh, discovering the character and um, I guess learning your lines, I hate saying that phrase but yeah getting the, the lines in you and doing your research on the piece um you also have to rehearse so it's like all these all this time that i think a lot of people don't realize that you have to put into it um so i was very careful about that now when covid started <laughs> i became a monster um because all of a sudden i have access to all these studios that i didn't wasn't able to go to before because I'm based in Orange County. A lot of the studios are in LA. That's a hellish commute. And, um, you know, I didn't want to take the two hours at best to go back and forth to go to these classes. So now that I can do it online, I just started start signing up for everything. Um, I, at one point, was taking seven at a time. And the seven, way. Seven. seven courses concurrently. Concurrently. Wow. <laughs> See, I, I told you, she's, yeah, legendary. It's insanity, I know that. I know that. And there were times where I was like, why did I do this to myself? But when I was finished, I'm really glad that I did. Um, so what yeah. types of courses, what types of classes were you taking? So different different studios, so that, that I, that's yeah. actually a great idea. I hadn't thought about doing that. Yeah. Uh, but so everybody, everybody has different theories and different ways of teaching. And then on top of that, you need to network as an actor. That is imperative to your career, period. And going to different studios allows the networking. It allows you to see the different types of theories. It allows you to meet different teachers and it allows you to find out what works for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, very, very important for sure. I, I know yeah. I can speak to that myself. Uh, my own, I mean, we all have the same experience, I'm sure, but you, you learn from one teacher and you, and you take some things and then you discover a second or a third or fourth. And at some point you realize, oh, okay, I really connect with that person. Uh, the technique that they're teaching, their personality, both, whatever. And that's when you, you have these, well, for me, I have spurts of learning 
where I've discovered a whole bunch of new things all at once because it just becomes so much more engaging. Right, right, so much more. Um, so as far as the type of classes I was taking, this was probably the hardest term. I'm taking the same amount of classes now. Well, starting in fall, I will be in mm. a couple of weeks. Um, but I was a lot smarter in adding these. In the seven class thing I'm about to tell you, I just added everything I could. So I was taking intermediate scene study through the Actor Studio of Orange County, as well as script analysis through them, improv, and audition technique. And that was the class that you and I were in together. Oh, yeah. um, all those were really demanding classes, especially scene study. To be honest with you, if I had, had I known the demand that class was going to have on my time, I don't think I would have taken it. It was, it was hard, but it really elevated my ability to like break down a script. So I'm really glad I took it and I would take it again if they offered it. Um, and then I was also taking improv through the groundlings. And they had a, uh, like a sketch writing class, which normally you have to be invited to take, but because they're trying to drum up revenue right now due to everything, they're allowing people to be in certain levels of the classes. Right. So I jumped in one because I'm a writer. Um, I never really dreamed about being like a screenwriter or anything, but I thought, hell, let me kind of learn something, you know? Um, and it was the hardest thing ever. I have to tell you, sketch writing is really difficult. Um, I was in tears some days. <laughs> writing. Well, learning new skills is always difficult. Right? Yeah. Especially, you know, interest is one thing, but then learning those skills, especially when you're very committed to it, as, as I know that you are, it's because you want to do well, right? And so you're not, right. I'm, I'm not satisfied if I just do kind of a half ass thing. So I get it learning a new skill and uh, it's a difficult one to begin with it is it's difficult um another thing that actually kind of inspired me to take that screenwriting class was that i in the intermediate class i was in i was um i was actually given two scenes to do instead of the typical one because we had some guy drop and um one of the scenes i was given was a sketch mm. actually it was with victor who you just had on yes. and um yes. sorry philip well philip knows this but victor and i hated it <laughs> Like, we did not think it was funny. We did not like it, but we were really happy to have it because of the fact we had such a strong reaction to it. We were like, this is a great opportunity for us to make it ourselves. And I realized that like, sketch acting is a whole different world. So how is it a whole, I, I'm not, I've never done one. So tell me about it. What's, what's, how is it's it more, different? So what we're learning, you don't like, craft this character who's this big whatever you know what I mean like everything's about subtleties and specificity all acting is about specificity even sketch but with uh sketch it's very much about this like character that you're in and I found that really hard for me to find because I was so used to not going big I was know? just gonna say so is it like a character like for example think uh, SNL S Anybody, exactly anything, on SNL. SNL. Yeah. Yeah. anything on SNL, yeah, anything on SNL, yeah, yeah, so you yeah, have to change your, like, it's definitely different, you have to change your tone of voice and you have to accept the rules of the world, right, which is something we do in television and film all the time, but typically in a sketch it's like way more out there that you're gonna have to accept this, and as a logical individual it's really hard for me, and then, um, you know, you take these little, uh, silly things that may happen every day and you have to make them big and funny right. and it's just not something that my mind did so I thought that okay one I can understand like the science for lack of a better word the art of writing a sketch so I can be a better sketch actor you know in case I ever get host SNL and then um just I mean, more talk to you about that by the way I'm sorry? I want to I I talk to your people because we're going to make some arrangements to get you on SNL. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> My non-existent agent, yes. And, um, and it's always good to have tools in your belt as an actor. You know, there's so many actors that start off in their cast type, which is not something that people should shun, in my opinion. And then eventually they break out of it and they do something else. Like we just saw with Steve Carell, he's always been that like goofy idiot kind of character and now he was just on the morning show 
and I don't know if you guys saw his monologue about him being vilified as a rapist, but at the end of it, I was like, someone help this rapist. Like, you know what I mean? So like, you have the ability to grow. And as an actor, I think people do also expect that out of us as yeah. well as ourselves. And so I thought, let me just add more tools to my belt. And then on top of that, I also took it to be completely transparent is because I'm in the um, core track at, at the Groundlings Improv School. And once you finish the improv track, you may get invited to d get into their writing track. So I thought, well, let me have some stuff up my sleeve that the other students won't have, yeah. <laughs> just in case. No, you know. it's great. I, yeah. I mean, there's the, one of the things that I think that, that I've learned and I, I would definitely advise to, to new actors is go beyond A, your comfort zone, mm -hmm. uh, learn new skills, and B, I think it's important to learn those other skills, whichever they are, they happen to be uh, either in front of the camera, behind the camera, improv, sketch, uh, how to use your voice properly, uh, breathing techniques, everything that you can get your hands on because you'll learn a little bit of something, how, how to do accents, I can't do accents, but how to do, you, you take a little bit here, a little bit there from all these things and you, you set it perfectly, a tool in your tool belt. And you can pull that tool out and make use of it in, in, a, in a scene uh, during any kind of work. Uh, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, applicable. I mean, I use my acting skills, the stuff that I learned in acting class on that industrial shoot. Uh, how to have a natural conversation with my mother in a very unusual situation. You get glaring lights on you and there's people coaching you in, in real time on, on what, what roughly they want you to do pull some tools out and, and use those things. So that, I think it's a, right. it's a great point. Right, also to kind of continue off that, it also teaches you maybe what type of acting you want to do. I always thought I wanted to be a regular on SNL, like my entire life, to be honest with you. And that's part of the reason I started getting into acting. I was like, I'm gonna be on SNL. I'm not that kind of actor. That's what I learned doing yeah. all the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm okay with that. I'm perfectly okay with that, you know? But you, you're never gonna find out these things if you're not experimenting. Right. And one other thing, I, 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 this, this theme has come up uh, a lot for me lately. Um, it's the idea of li linking, joining, what's the word? Aligning, I think is the best word. What goes on in your brain and what comes out of your mouth and, and how you look and how, you, how, you, how others perceive you. Yes. And so to your point about being a, an SNL sketch artist, I may think that I'm, I'm the funniest guy on earth, but then when I, when I actually start trying to be funny in front of others, in front of a camera, I realize that it feels really weird and different up here in my brain. And then maybe that's something I enjoy or I don't. Um, and then also I get to judge the reactions of the others that are, that are watching me and the feedback that I get from my, from my teacher at, at this point in my career. Um, and eventually you just you decide uh, yeah it's for me or it's not for me it's, a, right. it's an interesting experience that i've been coming across and it sounds right. like insane yeah it, it very much similar and um it was an interesting uh journey in discovering that because when i first started acting um i started doing a lot of research on my cast type so that means i started surveying a ridiculous amount of people in various ways whether it was in person in classes or in person at the mall by my house or online using Google surveys. And everybody, except for people that knew me really well, like my inner circle friends, everybody said, not comedy. I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. <laughs> and I was like, watch this. I'm gonna go be the funniest human being in the world. Like, watch, watch. Um, no, they were right. And you, <laughs> as an actor, you have to be open to accepting these things because the way you see yourself is not how other people perceive you. It's just, yeah, yeah. You know, so what, I think what you're referring to there, to a large extent, is is your personal brand. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, I, I, it's perfect segue because I was I was gonna bring up the fact, uh, Rochelle, you mentioned that we were together in a class uh, with Amber Friendly at the Actor Studio of Orange County uh, on on audition technique, and one of the things that Amber talked about was understanding your personal brand, and uh, and 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 cultivating it. So a personal brand really refers to, uh, if I, so I'll use myself. 
and, and also a little bit of a sidebar because I think one of the most interesting things that I've ever ha 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 have happened in class is what Amber did is she said, okay guys, well, who does Vinny look like to you? Start typing into the, to the Zoom chat. What, is, what characters can Vinny play? And it wasn't, it was based basically uh, on what do I look like and how do, you, how do they perceive me? And then I, and, and you have to gather that information and, and use that to your advantage. Uh, because that is who you are, whether you like it or not. Right. You can certainly change it, right? You can, yeah. you can cultivate well, something different, but at least to start with, as a beginning actor. Definitely. And it's going to evolve as you age and as different life events happen to you. you know? Like if you uh, have a kid, your essence is going to change. If you lose a loved one, your essence is going to change. Things yeah. like that, you know? So that's something that we also need to accept. And I think we see a lot of like actors fall off because they refuse to accept this evolution of right. themselves. Yeah, it's, also, it's also a blessing that it changes, right? Because yes. it's something to embrace if you have a, a, a big life event that affects you positively or negatively. Uh, as an actor, you have to be thinking as a professional here, how can I leverage that event to, 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 to emote, to have emotion in, in whatever way, or, or just, just to, Involve it in in your acting. Yep. So it's not yep. necessarily a bad thing that that, that things. It's not at you. all. It's a gift. Yeah. Like be open Great to word. it. Be open to it. So, with all that said, what was your what did your survey find? What's your brand? Well, I was very lucky, minus the whole SNL life, was that I was a spot on with my brand. So other than doing SNL, I've always wanted to do like mystery thrillers um, and maybe like not super gory horrors, but horrors for lack of a better term right now. And uh, like the bitch. And <laughs> that's what I got basically. Okay. <laughs> like but one thing I did discover, which yeah. shocked the hell out of me, I have to say, was that people perceive me as wholesome and although I got a lot of people think I'm from the East Coast, I also got a lot of Midwest. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I can see, I can see East Coast for sure, but uh, uh, Midwest. Thank uh, you. Those are those might be people that have never lived in the Midwest, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Well, okay. So, and people who know me, whenever I say wholesome Midwest, they laugh their ass off because they know it's like <laughs> that's not me whatsoever. Yeah. Can <laughs> like, play that one on TV? Yeah, right. But I can play one on TV exactly. Um, but the people that I was getting this feedback from are people that barely spoke to me if at all. So I took all this data, crunched it, whatever was like the most uh, yeah prevalent is what my I used to create my brand and then I took these like five words that lie under my brand and I took it to a headshot photographer and was like okay I'm ready for headshots like this these are my essences and this is my brand so when I was talking to her about the Midwest thing and just was like I, I accepted it because I got it you know especially from a lot of like agents and managers and such I was like but uh <laughs> like I don't okay. agree and she said it's because of my face shape because I'm tiny and because once you start talking to me, I do have this like sweet kind of high pitched, maybe sometimes nasally voice. And I was like- actually listening to you though? That's my question. I, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I, more than I thought, right? Yeah. And I was, yeah, and I was like, that's okay. <laughs> that's so, fine. That's, so that's how you make use of your brand. I was going to ask that question next. So yeah. you, you took you took some you took that information, and uh, you got some headshots. I, I think I saw some draft uh, headshots recently. So you just mm -hmm. got them done. Yeah. Great. What, what? How else are you going to leverage that brand? Are you going to, or for example, I can imagine that we would want to target uh, auditions. Like when I when I submit myself for auditions. Right, so you just target your cast type. So that entire research basically just boils down your cast types at the end of the day. Um, and it shows agents and representation in general how to market you. Um, you know, sometimes people don't know, and so they'll get an agent and the agent will figure all that out for them, but it really might not align with them at the end of the day, right? So well, you wanna show representation that you are safe, that you are not going to be this gamble. So when you go in there, ready to submit, knowing your brand, consistently booking these different things that lie under your brand, you are showing them that you are a reliable actor, right? right? 
Um, so yeah, okay, another, I wanna kinda quick rewind real quick. Another thing I did to find out my brand, other than the surveying all these random people, was I just submitted for every student film that kind of matched me. And from there, I went, okay, these are the ones I got auditions for, and these are the ones I booked. Yeah. And um, from there, I also got like a lot more handle on what my cast type would be. And um, it, this is a good time for you guys to do that because like if you're new, this is the time where you get, you have this awesome ability to be able to play whatever you want and, <laughs> and audition for whatever you want. It's not Quentin Tarantino production status, but like, you know, so like do it because you might discover something within yourself that like you never thought of. For me, I never thought that I would play a mother and I never thought that I would be seen as wholesome. I was uh, booked as a mother and as someone really conservative and wholesome, you know, and like, boom, yeah, boom. So like going in with footage or at least headshots that convey these types of these cast types and your brand in general is just going to make you far ahead of most other actors who do not have a handle on this and who expect the managers, the agents, the casting directors to tell them how they see you. If you really want to make it in this business, you have to realize that you are a business. You own your own business, right? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, you're like, your own boss yes, and your you own director. Yeah. Right, right. And so you got so far as you direct your career, I should say, yeah. Exactly. And so you got to show people how they see you, you know? And that's one of the things that really kills business or is actors' careers is not lack of talent. It's lack of not knowing what they're doing in the business. Direction, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, just being, it's, I think it, it, if I were to relate it to the actual act of acting, it's being specific. Yes, exactly. Right? Because Beautiful. If there's companies out there that do a billion different things, those companies are probably massive, but they, like Amazon, for example, does a billion different things, but they started off doing something very specific when, when yes. they began, and that was selling books, as it were. I don't know if anybody remembers it back then, but they I began do. selling books. <laughs> uh, and and since then, they've, they're selling a lot more, and they're doing a lot of other things as well. But being specific allowed them to be successful. Exactly, exactly. There are actors who make their entire career off of this, you know, yes. and they may never get out of their cast type and maybe it's because they don't want to. Maybe they enjoy being that creepy guy and taking that check all the way to the bank going, yep, I'm a creep, <laughs> you know? The guy, so there, there's two examples that are, that are worth mentioning. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the first one. Um, oh, oh. Uh, He's a, he's a Chinese-American actor. I, I don't know his name. George Takai? No, he's Japanese. No, no uh, everybody would recognize him because he's been in 1,100 films throughout his career. He's, I think he's 85, 90 years old now. Oh, wow. But he's been in an immense number of films, but he plays a very, very narrow character. And he does it extremely well. So that's one. And then the other one, uh, what, is the, the guy who played uh, was it Jason, the guy who wrote the hockey mask? That mm -hmm. that particular actor, he's been involved in that horror flick uh, area of of the industry his entire life, and he's very successful. And he tours the country doing the the uh, uh, the conference circuit, not the conferences, but like a comic con, yeah, things. conventions. There you go. Uh, very successful. You don't necessarily have to be the Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah. a beautiful man or a beautiful woman to, to succeed in this. In you this. don't at all. And in fact, if you are the complete antithesis of that, own it. Yeah. Own it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because Hollywood needs all of that. The entertainment industry needs all of that. There's room for everybody. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, da, 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 da. So you mentioned entertainment industry, and I know yeah. that I wanted to come back to something that uh, I know that you also do, but you have a YouTube channel at a minimum and probably some other things. Tell us about Views and Paradox. Views and Paradox is a podcast that my cousin and I, he's also a filmmaker and based in New York, we run together. It was originally his podcast seven years ago, I believe he originally started it. Um, and it just, he dissolved it. And then with everything happening with COVID and us sitting around not having anything to do, called me up knowing I just got into the business and was like, hey, 
wanted to host this with me. And when we first started it, it was kind of like, let's just do it because we ain't got anything else to do. But now we're loving it. Like it's the most fun we've ever had. What we do is every week we bring on a guest who's preferably within the industry. Although we do have some wiggle room there. Like we'll bring on a Disney nerd or something, you know, for a Disney film. But um, so what, do you, do? And, what do you actually, so you bring on a guest. And then yeah, we'll so we bring on a guest on. and we discuss a film, usually that the guest picks. Um, and then that John and I, my cousin, agree on. And what we do is we break down the production of it. We break down the uh, theme or like the meaning behind the film and then how this has a modern social impact on today's world. Um, and yeah, it's good discussion. And I think that we talk about film in a way that a lot of people don't typically do so. And the point of it is we just want people to see films beyond entertainment. Um, I mean, there's some movies out there that like, it's strictly entertainment, hello Marvel. But, um, you know, there's film, in my opinion, changes people. And I think that's what makes it so beautiful. And so does television, but we focus on film. Um, and being able to like watch a movie and seeing beyond what they're saying and noticing the little things that may have happened in production and knowing how much work goes into it outside of what you're seeing yeah. just really uh, expands one's appreciation for it. Absolutely. And, yeah. Oh, sorry, you're finish. Um, but I think that's about it, yeah. So the, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. As uh, a person who's come to, to this profession uh, only recently, I was, and I think we share this in common, is I, I didn't really watch all that much television, didn't watch all that many movies, but now that I'm trying to, to do something in the industry, I, I take naturally more interest in it. And one of the things that I have, have really been amazed at is when you see good act, actor, acting, excuse me, um, and what they do on screen, and I'm gonna focus just on the actors here for a moment, uh, one of my favorite characters is, is uh, Columbo, Lieutenant Columbo, who is a, a television series that ran from 1968 all the way to 2003. It was very, with some holes in the middle. Peter Falk, I love, I love watching him, but when you watch him and what he's doing on screen, uh, there's, there's really not much going on. And that's the, that's the key that I've, that I've discovered that is very, I didn't expect to discover because as you're watching uh, as, a, as, a, as an audience member, you're just watching for the action. But now as I'm watching it as an actor, I see specifically how little he's doing and mm -hmm. how realistic that is. And that has been a focus for me uh, in the last, I don't know, six, eight months is, is really trying to hone in, do less, do less, do less as an actor. But- uh, It's good you do too good. much though, because I was told that if you do too much, it's easier to chip it away than it is to build it. So don't beat yourself up for doing too much. No, that is that is something, you know, because I've definitely heard that as well. But I think I'm at this moment right now in my, <clears throat> in my learning where I'm not really sure how to interpret that anymore. Because what I used to interpret, the way I used to interpret that uh, instruction from my instructors, do too much rather than not enough, was to be more showy, right? I think is how it, but when you, when you look at, when you take that and you compare it against what your favorite actor does in a, in a, in a well-regarded movie uh, for its acting, and you compare the, that statement versus what they're doing, it doesn't match. The, there's, there's no showiness going on. There's no, uh, it's less, it's about compressing everything. Uh, that's my perspective anyway. I mean, there's that's how I see it. Meisner says, be private in public. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. So so that's really interesting. I, I'm glad that, so views and paradox then, how has it informed you as an actor? Uh, because you now, now you're having to analyze movies, maybe in a way right. that, you, that you didn't before. So what's right. what thing you've learned from it? Well, first of all, I'm super glad I took that uh, script analysis class because that really helped. But I'm really starting to just be able to watch a movie and know immediately like the world I'm in, understand the rules, understand the tone, and see beyond what 
we're looking at, right? And also, because I'm watching it more, I'm starting to understand the way that the actors are making me feel while I'm watching it, mm -hmm. um, which is really important, obviously, you know? And like, uh, what did I just watch? Um, Uncut Gems. Oh, that movie gave me anxiety the whole time. But that's the point. That's with the Softie Brothers, like, gig. That's their style, <laughs> you know? I'm sorry? That's their brand. That's their brand, <laughs> exactly. So it's be allowed me to see this more, more obviously, I guess I could say, to appreciate it, even if I don't necessarily like the movie my it myself. And also, allowing me to really like learn what the scene and film in general is about and being able to like say look at watch this movie and then go read a similar script with a similar feeling and know what they're looking for which prior to this because again we share this in common i didn't really watch a lot of tv i am a big film watcher but not tv which is a different monster and so it's been really allowing me to like yeah, understand the tone, what's being said, what they need to accomplish, and what they need of me as an actor. And it's also fun to like uh, go watch, in my opinion, comparing their uh, the actor to like what they're doing in that film compared to like who they are. I really enjoy doing that. And I'll also uh, once I wouldn't finish the movie, I'll, if I can find it, I'll find the audition video for their role and then I'll come see what the differences are. That's interesting. Yeah, really? if you can find it, you can't always find it. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Well, we covered a lot of ground, Rochelle. I wanna thank you very much for coming with me today uh, and joining me on The Starting Actor. Thank uh, you. Where can we find you online? If people wanna book you uh, or get in touch with you, where can we find you on social media? Uh, Instagram at RochelleRacine.com. I'll send it to Vinny so he can link me below because my name is uniquely spelled. And then, um, or on the YouTube, or pot, uh, we're also on iTunes and Spotify, ViewsInParadox.com, and uh, any of those places. But if you want to book me as like an actor, I would prefer if you went through my Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Good advice. Right. Well, Rochelle, thank you very much for joining me again. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you in class. Thank you. Ciao.